course the first real test being shot at and everything else was at Iwo Jima. And we started bombing that on uh, February the 16th, 1945. Uh, that was three days before D-Day. And being up in the air, you could look around and see hundreds and hundreds of U.S. ships on an island that was only six miles long. And, uh, Mount Suribachi at one end, and sort of like a teardrop-looking teardrop island where there's no there was no life, you couldn't see any life at all. But there were 20,000 Japanese that were reinforced and buried underneath the ground there waiting for us to do this. And the reason for the whole battle was to capture the, the two air, two landing strips that were there. Uh, and one was under construction and we needed those for uh, our fighter planes to land which were supporting the B-29 bombers flying to mainland of Japan. This was kind of like a stop and off place. If we could use it, we needed it. If we were, especially if the planes were crippled or anything else. Our last mission, which was the day we got sunk, um, there was four of us planes went in, because we usually traveled in sorties of four. and. Uh, the island was mapped out so that we knew exactly what to pinpoint the bomb, what areas, because they tell us to go in A1 or A5 or Z3 or whatever. And then these these areas were spotted out by mostly marine pilots in a uh, small aircraft, something like a Piper Cub, I'd call it, or something like that, mm -hmm. single engine, and very dangerous. It's a very dangerous mission for them to spot where the enemy had uh, their bunkers and their and the aircraft guns and so forth, because you couldn't see they were so well camouflaged and so and everything buried underground. I said, like, "Come on now!" They were the Mount Suribachi, for instance. It was five, uh, seven stories underground, and so. But anyhow, that's that's. The island, the narrowest part of the island was only about a mile and a half across. That was at the base of Mount Sarabachi. And it spreads out a little bit to maybe two or three miles. Mm -hmm. But we were supposed to be bombing in advance of the Marines landing. With all the bombing and everything else that was happening and all the shelling being done by the battleships and the cruisers and the destroyers, everything we could think of thrown in there. Why? They were still not doing any hardly any damage. So the Marines had to go in with flamethrowers. Of course, we did. Some of the planes were dropping uh, napalm bombs, which were napalm is a burning oil right. that runs down in the holes and burns them out of their their caves and so forth. So, and the Marines went in with flamethrowers. And I eventually that started knocking them out. But it was a horrible death. They were there to die. They were there to, 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 all the books I read and everything says that they were there for every one, which was 20,000, they were there to take 10 enemies. Mm -hmm. 10 of the enemies. Each man swore before he could perform. They were there to die, really, for their emperor, but that's, that was their life. I mean, that's the way they felt. That they, it was a disgrace for Japanese to surrender. In the ready room, I was talking to another radio man. That was off the old Saratoga, which was a CV-3, built in somewhere around 1922. And while we were in the air, I recognized the fact that, uh, well, I heard over the radio that Saratoga was under attack. And uh, we were taking their planes, torpedo bombers and so forth, whatever we could take on from their ship because they had taken five hits. And uh, I was standing talking to him, he, he was from Saratoga off a torpedo bomber and landed on our ship and I asked him how it felt like landing on a small carrier, a jeep carrier. We call it a jeep carrier. It's, it's only 500, there's only 560 foot long and about 400, 
480 foot flight deck, approximately something like that. So he, he says like landing on the matchbox, I'll never forget that statement. And uh, right, that's when we started getting, hearing our, our guns going off. We had 20 millimeters and 40 millimeters along each catwalk on each side. And that's when um, our guns going off. I said, oh, well, we're in trouble. You know, and it was, it was, well, I had, I had just come back from the bombing mission too. And so that's when we knew that, and then the captain, after several explosions and stuff, the captain said, prepare to abandon ship. But he couldn't say abandon ship because all the communications and electricity went out on the ship. So everybody took it for granted. We better get off the ship. And that's what we did. And I, Went down. I went down the line in the front and the bow on the right side, where it was where I was supposed to on the starboard side. The wind was blowing ship this way, you know, and I went down on that against the wind, so that you shouldn't go down on the other side because or jump off on the other side because sometimes you couldn't get away from the ship if it was sinking. And when I hit the water, there was somebody out there, and I. And I still think it was the executive officer. He was crying for help. And we, another air crew, and myself, grabbed him, and we got him to a. I believe it was a, a, a life raft of some sort. It could have been a, out of a out of a uh, fighter plane. And then I swam towards another raft that had about six guys holding on to a one-man life raft. <clears throat> and. We had about 10 or 20 foot waves at the time, and it was February 21st, and it was cold, the water was cold. And I stayed on that raft, or stayed holding on to the raft, because it's, it's, it would only hold one man. And I pushed one fellow up in the center of it, because he was slipping down, evidently he was wounded, I don't know. But I told, I told some of the fellows, I said, there's a red light out there, and I thought it was a buoy. And what would be a buoy out 35 miles out in the China Sea, away from Iwo Jima? I didn't know how far out we were. Uh, what would be a buoy doing out there? But anyhow, I swam. And I said, I'm going to take off to it because, like I said, I, I loved. This. I was glad to get in the water, really, uh, to get off the bottom. You know, the ship blowing up. And one of my friends said, "Tom, come back, come back." And I said, "No, I'll see you." And I thought. It, I thought if it was a buoy, I could climb up on it and hold on to it until somebody came along to rescue it. No ships had lights on out there. I mean, it was totally blackout situation, except that one red light. And you can't tell distances of lights on on the water. It could be 20 miles. It could be two miles or whatever. So I swam and I swam towards this light and. The next thing I knew, this dark mass was looming up on me, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm going to be run over by a ship, you know. And it was the Edmonds, called the USS Edmonds, and it's a destroyer escort that was with our group. And somebody threw a spotlight on me, and the, white, the red light was the report light they'd left on. The captain ordered one light, the red light, to be left on. And then somebody threw a spotlight on me, and and said, grab the, grab the line or grab the rope. They had the ropes hanging down the side of the ship. So I grabbed one, not knowing there was anybody around me. And some, one of the, one of the uh, sailors floating around out there said, hey, he said, uh, get in line, sailor, just like I was, you know, in the chow hall or something. That was rather ironic and comical, too, at the same time, you know. So, but anyhow, I held on to that rope and went up the ship was listing. It was not under power. I thought it was. And it was just sitting there waiting. And it was ro rolling all over the place and went way up in the air and went down under the water again. And I man managed to get up that uh, line and a couple strong hands grabbed me and on, on the deck and then they put me, since I had my flight uh, jacket and fly, uh, flight uniform on and so forth, they thought I was an officer, which I wasn't. I was a petty officer, aviation radio, I'm third class. <clears throat> and they put me in officer quarters, 
And then my pilot showed up in officer quarters, and he said, uh, Tom, what are you doing in here? And I said, I don't know. They put me in here. He said, you don't belong in here. That's how bad it was back in those days. You know, they probably do the same thing today. When the ship got sunk, I went back in the, uh, in the ready room after the captains had abandoned ship. And I was thinking, well, I can't lose my tailor-made uniform on my picture album because that was all some of my girlfriends and things like that, you know. And that was my great possessions that I had. So I, I opened my locker door and, of course, ammunition was going off and all the, all the, all the whole hangar deck was aflame. And all the fellows in the, in the mess hall, which is the stern of the ship, they all got killed down there. And the lights went out, and I thought, I opened my locker and thought, what am I doing with a picture out in the middle of the ocean, you know? So, and tailor-made uniform, those were my two possessions that I wanted to really save. And I grabbed a, another uh, waist-type light belt and my pistol and got out of there because the walls were buckling, the lights were out, and I thought, well, maybe I better leave out of here, you know, instead of grabbing the other and say goodbye to the, the sentimental possessions.